Tonight, a catastrophic collision on a Manitoba highway involving a semi truck and a van full of seniors. The staggering death toll. I did see a bunch of people on the ground. And the start of a grueling investigation. We need to get everything right. It's critical. Canada's public safety minister admits to a major communication breakdown. It is uh, very clear that I should have been briefed at the time. Fallout after the controversial Paul Bernardo prison move. Plus, following the money trail on foreign interference. They all use your address. An Ontario city, the target of suspected meddling by Beijing. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. A stretch of the Trans-Canada Highway in Manitoba has become the site of one of the country's deadliest road crashes. The fiery collision between a bus and a semi killed 15 people and injured 10. It happened just before noon near Carberry, more than 150 kilometers west of Winnipeg. Sadly, this is a day in Manitoba and across Canada that will be remembered as one of tragedy and incredible sadness. Most of these now charred frames, seats filled with seniors heading to the Sand Hills Casino. CTV's Manitoba Bureau Chief Joe Makishan is in Carberry tonight and starts us off. The horror of this crash was immediately clear. A fire and fatalities, 15 dead at this intersection of the Trans-Canada Highway. What I can confirm right now is that a bus carrying approximately 25 people collided with a semi at the intersection of Highway 1 and Highway 5. The individuals in the bus were from Dauphin and surrounding areas, and it's my understanding that the majority were seniors. The group traveling two hours from their home in western Manitoba to a local casino. They were only a few short kilometers from their destination when the collision occurred. When I passed by the scene, the fire trucks were there putting out the fire. And as I continued on from there, I saw about four or five ambulances the, um, heading westbound. Police from across the province were dispatched to the scene. And air ambulances lifted the critically injured to hospitals. A code orange was declared at Winnipeg's Health Sciences Centre as trauma teams worked to help patients. Most of the injuries were head injuries or orthopedic in nature. RCMP say conditions were clear and dry when the bus attempted to cross the four lanes of the Trans-Canada Highway heading south and was hit by a semi traveling east. Police say both drivers survived the crash. This is the worst mass casualty collision since 16 died in central Saskatchewan in 2018. The Humboldt Broncos hockey team was heading to a playoff game when their bus was hit by a semi. This incident does have echoes of the tragic collision that happened in Humboldt, Saskatchewan. And we are very much aware of that. Manitoba RCMP are now working with Saskatchewan investigators from the Broncos crash. As traffic reconstructionists try and piece together this tragedy, tonight in Dauphin, many families are still waiting to find out if their loved ones survived. Jill Makishan, CTV News, near Carberry, Manitoba. There is still no clear explanation on why Justin Trudeau and his public safety minister were among the last to know about a controversial prison transfer, especially since members of their staff were given a heads up about serial killer Paul Bernardo's move from maximum security. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver on the questions met with tight lipped responses. For a minister who almost always stops to take questions, this was unusual. What happened in your office, Minister? Good morning. And when Marco Mendicino finally did step up to the mic, he offered few answers about Paul Bernardo's transfer to a medium security prison. It is uh, very clear that I should have been briefed at the time, um, and that is something that I made abundantly clear uh, to my staff. The Correctional Service of Canada says it informed the minister's office in March, and again five days before Bernardo was moved on May 29th, from a maximum to a medium security prison. No! All that time, the minister was kept in the dark. What was the explanation from your staff as to why so they look, didn't tell you? It, the short answer is it is unacceptable. Uh, and 
My job is to make sure that it doesn't happen again. The Prime Minister's office also found out in March. Justin Trudeau was briefed the day the transfer happened, the same day the Corrections Commissioner first informed the families of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. We now know why the Prime Minister refuses to fire his incompetent and misleading public safety minister, and it is that the Prime Minister himself was the one who accepted the transfer of Paul Bernardo. Regardless of who knew what when, prisoner advocates say Mendicino and other elected officials can't tell the independent corrections commissioner what to do. And that decisions about transfers are based on factors including an inmate's security classification, their risk to public safety, staff and other inmates, their escape risk and their psychological risk assessment. These things are all administered under the legislation in accordance with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and it's left to them to do that without political interference. The lawyer representing the victim's families doesn't agree with that assessment and believes that the nature of Bernardo's crimes makes this an exceptional circumstance that should enable the public safety minister to direct the Commissioner of Corrections, Omar, to put Bernardo back in maximum security. All right, Annie, thank you. Another issue that has the federal government in the hot seat is election meddling. And as there are renewed calls for a public inquiry into foreign interference, the spotlight tonight is on one of Ontario's largest cities, where CTV's Judy Trin follows the money. Markham, Ontario is Canada's most diverse city. 70% are people of colour. One in five come from China, making it an ideal city for Beijing to target. Local politicians, including school board trustees, are, because we typically are out of the media spotlight, are probably more um, vulnerable to this sort of influence. Democracy watchdogs say agents of China's Communist Party help candidates get elected on city council first, then support them in provincial and federal races. The whole thing about foreign interference is that uh, you want somebody that you uh, that you want to uh, be elected so that eventually they can be a mouthpiece. CTV News analyzed the campaign finances of Markham's candidates in last year's municipal election and found some irregularities. According to election data, 12 people with different last names use this address to donate to one local candidate. This homeowner did donate to the candidate, but he doesn't know several people on the list. Thomas Budd. Lina Lu? Lina Lu, that I don't know. The city's deputy mayor, Michael Chan, is suing CSIS and some media organizations for alleging he was involved in election interference. Chan raised $225,000 from donors, the most of any candidate. A lot of your supporters would support the Chinese Communist Party, would support China. I have so many people, okay. And uh, there are people who support uh, the, uh, the, the country they come from. Chen and the mayor were at this Chinese New Year celebration in January. Also present, diplomat Jia Wei, now expelled from Canada after trying to intimidate conservative MP Michael Chong. What they do between functions and other times, that's way beyond our ability to be able to investigate, to evaluate. The RCMP is currently investigating more than 100 cases of foreign interference, but it's not known how many involve Markham. Omar. All right, Judy. Judy Trin back in Ottawa tonight. Thank you. As many as 100 children may have drowned in the Mediterranean Sea after the migrant boat carrying them sank off the coast of Greece. The country has declared three days of mourning. As CTV's John Vennavelli Rao reports, hope of finding survivors is fading. New video shows some of the male survivors being lifted off a rescue boat as the frantic search continues for the many missing who'd been on this shockingly overcrowded vessel, including women and children. At a Greek port, this Syrian man was looking for his wife who'd been trying to join him in Europe. He said she'd paid about $6,000 Canadian to smugglers to get on the boat. At least nine people are under arrest tonight, accused of human trafficking. The boat had left Libya and was on its way to Italy Wednesday when it capsized and sank off Greece. Survivors estimate there were as many as 750 people on board and between 40 and 100 children kept in the hold, and it's feared they may have drowned. And you can only imagine 
what sort of desperation a family must be in put their children in the hold of a boat that they fear may or may not make it uh, across the water. It's quite, quite, a, quite a tragic situation. So far, at least 78 people have been confirmed dead and no additional bodies were found today. About 100 survivors, all men from countries like Pakistan, Syria and Egypt, are worried about the women and children who were below deck. Almost everyone is with family, uh, some of them with friends, some of them uh, talked about having kids having a kid and uh, he doesn't know where is it. Greece's Coast Guard refuting claims it knew the ship was in trouble for hours before sending help in waters considered to be the most dangerous migrant crossing in the world. The UN says since 2014, more than 20,000 deaths have been recorded on the route. Greece has declared three days of mourning and the tragedy, a horrific reminder of just how many make such perilous journeys. The UN this week said one in 74 people on Earth were forcibly displaced last year. This as there were more calls for the European Union today to change its migration policy, with one critic saying it had turned the seas off Greece into a watery grave. Omar. Just heartbreaking. All right, John, thank you. Tens of thousands flee their home countries every year to make this one home. And as of tomorrow, Canada will reach a major milestone. The population will hit 40 million on Friday and is on track to hit 50 million by 2043. Last year, Canada added more than a million people, the most ever in a 12-month period. Cooler weather is helping firefighters tame wild flames in Quebec, British Columbia and across the Atlantic today. So far, firefighters from at least nine countries have made their way here to help battle Canada's worst wildfire season in decades. CTV's Melanie Nagy on the international response and the new reinforcements in Alberta. Breaking into song and dance before deploying to battle wildfires in Alberta for the second time this fire season, crews from South Africa are moving into position to help the hard-hit province. We are united as one and then we show that whenever we can sing like this, we can overcome anything. There are now more than 1,000 foreign firefighters in Canada, with the majority on the ground in Quebec and Alberta. They can hit the ground running and that's just a huge relief and it takes so much burden off of our firefighters. Across the country, there are more than 400 active wildfires. With so many burning so early, Canadian crews are exhausted. The support from overseas firefighters is not only welcomed, but necessary. We know that the peak of the wildfire season may still be several weeks away. In the past 24 hours, at least seven new fires started in B.C. and one of the largest ever recorded, the Donny Creek complex, continues to rage out of control in the northeast. We're seeing growth kind of in, in multiple directions um, of the fire driven by winds. But there is some good news. Recent rain in parts of the province slowed the spread of some fires. <laughs> For the thousands forced to flee the town of Tumbler Ridge last week, the favorable conditions mean they can finally go home. We are confident on that western flank, uh, given the work that has been able to be done by heavy equipment and ground crews, that has reduced that threat uh, that imminent threat. While many evacuation orders have been lifted, it's estimated nearly 19,000 Canadians remain out of their homes and communities. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. And from fires to twisters, we are seeing incredible new images of the tornadoes that roll through parts of Alberta. This is just one of the multiple funnel clouds spotted in the southern part of the province. Environment Canada confirmed some tornadoes did touch down. We cannot confirm exactly how many, the strength of them, um, so their rating, or what type of tornado they are at this time. Fortunately, no reports of injuries. Uh, looks like a large confirmed tornado on the ground. And powerful storms pushed through Oklahoma tonight, knocking out power to thousands. Softball-sized hail pummeled parts of Arkansas, denting boats and damaging cars. And this is what it looked like in parts of Alabama after punishing winds from a tornado toppled trees and ripped through houses. And overseas, parts of western India and Pakistan are also in the dark tonight after a major cyclone made landfall. High waves crashed the shores of Gujarat and gusty winds damaged property and uprooted trees. Nearly 200,000 people have been evacuated in both countries where the cyclone 
brought heavy rains and flooding. Coming up after the break, a seized cargo plane and Moscow's warning to Canada. Plus, thing to say, you've got to be proud of the people around you. Proud. An academic honor for an acclaimed Canadian performer. Russia's foreign ministry says it summoned a Canadian diplomat in Moscow over the seizure of a massive Russian cargo jet. It's one of the largest planes in the world and has been grounded at Toronto's Pearson Airport for more than a year. The seizure will allow Ottawa to give the plane to Ukraine or sell it and give Kyiv the profits. Canada's Defence Minister Anita Anand met with NATO defence chiefs in Brussels to discuss more support for Ukraine as troops make slow advances in their counteroffensive against the Kremlin. CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin reports. A battlefield exchange offers a glimpse of war in the trenches of Ukraine. The Wall Street Journal reported that a drone pilot said he decided to spare the life of a Russian soldier after he saw him gesturing. The drone delivered orders on how to surrender. This as Ukraine claims to have regained over 100 square kilometers of territory since the weekend. But progress is slow, often best measured in meters. Still, the head of NATO praised Ukraine's counteroffensive. The support NATO allies have been giving to Ukraine now for many, many months actually makes a difference uh, on the battlefield. That difference, say military experts, plays out on many fronts. It's a combination of equipment and intelligence. Luz, Lara but Ukraine is facing strong resistance. Russia claims to inflict 10 times more casualties than it endures. And as a bid to signal its control, the Kremlin announced today it would stage elections in occupied parts of Ukraine in just three months. In Kherson, airstrikes hit the downtown core, punching a hole in an office building. This is the first time they hit the city center with a rocket, says this man. This is scary. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency arrived at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, surveying potential risks after the partial collapse of a dam that caused widespread flooding. And defense ministers gathered at NATO headquarters in Brussels as a U.S.-led group of some 50 countries providing military aid to Ukraine is meeting. And I ask that the members of this contact group continue to dig deep. Canada says it's providing ammunition, air defense missiles and continuing training. Canada will be extending Operation Unifier, which is the training mission under which over 36,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been trained. Ukrainian fighter pilots are now being trained to fly F-16s, though NATO allies have not agreed on whether to deliver the aircraft to Ukraine. Genevieve Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. A Halifax man who spent nearly 17 years behind bars for a murder he did not commit has died. Glenna Soon was at the center of a high-profile wrongful conviction case dating back to the 1990s. He was sentenced to life in prison in 1999 for the stabbing death of his partner, a conviction that was overturned 20 years later. He was an inspiration uh, to our organization and to other wrongly convicted people, including myself. Uh, he persevered for years and years being the only one fighting for his innocence. No, what's up? Asun died suddenly while at a restaurant in Dartmouth last night. He was 67 years old. One of the most accomplished British stars of the 1960s and 70s has died. Glenda Jackson was 87. Pardon me for asking, but did you always get what you want when you wanted it? Jackson won a Best Actress Academy Award for her role in A Touch of Class and another Oscar for her work in Women in Love. Later on, she was a Labour Party MP and cabinet minister. She died peacefully at her London home this morning after a brief illness. Still ahead. A former UFC superstar accused of sexual assault at the NBA Finals. Former Ultimate Fighting star Conor McGregor is denying allegations of sexual assault at an NBA Finals game last week. The biggest name in UFC was a guest at the game and staged a mock fight with the Miami Heat mascot during halftime. The man in the costume reportedly needed medical attention after McGregor punched him twice. He says it was all part of his skit. 
Indigenous artists from Manitoba are gaining attention for their creative street artwork in downtown Regina. The mural called Path to Reconciliation was made with over 2,600 beads and created to inspire conversation and highlight Indigenous culture. Beading is kind of what we came up with because that's something that you see within every single culture. The installation will be featured in an opening ceremony for National Indigenous Peoples Day next week. And quite a sight in a small town in New Hampshire. It's a freaking black bear eating Charlie's nuts in the front seat of the truck. The bear somehow managed to climb inside a glass company's truck to eat a worker's lunch. It was later spotted outside taking a rest. No one was hurt, just a little hungry, but small sacrifice to give up a sandwich to a hungry bear. After the break, making the sound, starting to talk, finding honoring a legendary children's day. entertainer. There's only one thing to say you've got to be proud of the people around you, proud of the things that you do. Proud of your dreams and A pioneer of Canadian children's music and longtime advocate for inclusivity, Fred Penner was recognized for his achievements today with an honorary degree. As CTV's Bill Fortier reports, his inspiration comes from a very personal connection. <laughs> Hello there. Generations of Canadian and American kids have grown up to the words and music of Fred Penner. Come on, come on, get up, get up. The award-winning performer who strummed his way to fame in the 80s is still recording and touring. She just couldn't stay away. And now earning a new degree. Congratulations. Thank you. The University of Alberta giving Penner an honorary doctorate of letters today. It was a beautiful scene, a beautiful sight, and I was just so honored to be able to share a few words and a couple of songs. Honored for his music. You've got to be proud. And his decades of advocacy for underprivileged and special needs kids. We recognize his humanitarian efforts to uplift the lives of children around the world. Those two passions are linked by Penner's past. He used to listen to records with his sister Susie who had Down syndrome. It was amazing for me to witness the power of music and how it moved Susie. Susie died when Penner was a teen. At that point I felt that any contribution I could make as a musician would honor Susie in some way. So he chose children's music even though Penner's first degree was in economics. I did not want to be an economist. But the cat came back. Decades after his first appearance on The Elephant Show with Sharon Lois and Bram and 13 years of Fred Penner's place. <laughs> Isn't that something? He still inspires with music, positivity, and advice. Take good care of each other. That resonates with kids and even university graduates. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Edmonton. And that is a snapshot of this Thursday. Heather Wright will be here tomorrow. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching and good night.